Today's talk launches our new season of Collecting as Practice, a thematic residency and public program here at Delfina Foundation. It explores the politics, the philosophy, and the psychology of collecting. Our first season took place in April of 2017, which included nine artists in residence alongside six collectors. Yes, the world's first residency program for collectors who span from all over the world, from Ukraine, Brazil, Japan, Taiwan, and many other fantastic places, bringing a sense of what is happening in their local context in regards to um, art production, collection, and also dissemination. But most importantly, what we were looking at was kind of the value of objects, not the financial value, the social value of objects. So we were looking for very particular types of collectors to be in residence in this house, alongside our artists and curators. For those of you who haven't been here before, this room is normally the dining room for the residents. Um, the kitchen is off of that, and the residents live upstairs. So this house is very much a, a cradle for different types of conversations and debates that happen sometimes over lunch, sometimes over a cup of tea, sometimes over a late night party. This season of Collecting as Practice brings together more curators compared to artists, and another group of collectors, three in fact. The first arrived later, later this month. And this program, we are, with this particular program, we're looking at the articulation of narratives that surround art objects and how artists, institutions, and um, collectors are constantly trying to renegotiate meaning in regards to these objects. And here in the West, it's more complicated than it is in other parts of the world where we have a museum and the idea of the canon dominating our understanding of what uh, an object means in certain contexts, whether it's the post-colonial or uh, in this hyper-globalized world that we live in at the moment. Today's discussion is the first talk as part of this program. And I'm not gonna give you much details about the talk. Instead, I'm gonna introduce you to our talk's curator, Rose Lejeune, who's standing here next to me, um, trying to hide, but we're very much revisible in a minute. Um, Rose has been working us on the, on, with us on the last uh, Collecting as Practice program, as well as this one. And she is a curator, and I'm going to <laughs> um, read some notes, partly because I just got off a uh, very long flight from Saudi Arabia. Um, Rose Lejeune is a curator and researcher working with public institutions and private individuals to explore collecting contemporary art with a specific interest in context-based social and performative practices. This activity is delivered through several avenues, one of which is Collecting the Ephemeral, a research and consultancy project, and the other is Gallery Lejeune, so producing dynamic exhibitions that look at performative practices and kind of more complex aspects of art that in a way maybe exists outside somewhat of the art market or is not core uh, part of it. Rose is doing a PhD at Goldsmiths, and her research focuses on social practice, process, and, no and notions of transaction in the art market. That's Rose Lejeune. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Rose uh, to take over for today's panel, and she will introduce the rest of the speakers. Um, before I do that, I'm just gonna say it's great to have Mark here, Mark Dion, um, who is a former resident artist of Delfina Studios some 20 years ago. Yes. And he's back. Um, he's back for a retrospective uh, exhibition at the White Chapel, which opens this week. Over to you, Rose. Thank you very much. I wasn't expecting such a long uh, in bio biographical introduction. Um, so I'm not going to say too much, actually, um, more about the programme, but just to um, kind of talk a tiny bit about this afternoon and what we've been thinking about. What <laughs> Uh, we wanted, as Aaron says, to really use the opportunity of Mark being here and the retrospective to think more specifically through the programme about ideas about how artists have been working within collections and ideas about kind of constructing knowledge and um, thinking in particular, I guess, about natural history museums and the, again, the history of the collections that we have in this country in particular. So we're really happy today to have Mark here with us and he's going to give us a kind of short introduction to some of his work. Um, 
just to give a bit of background to anybody that doesn't know Mark, he is currently a mentor at Columbia University and the co-director of Mildred's Lane, a visual arts education and residency program in Pennsylvania. His work has recently been at Documenta 13, MoMA PS1, Guggenheim Bilbao, Minneapolis Institute of Art, very famously made an incredible work for the opening of um, Tate Modern here in 1919. Nine, um, uh, and as Aaron says, Mark was uh, one of the original Delfina residents. Um, uh, so, with him, we're very happy to welcome Raoul Arkansas Arkans Stein, <laughs> um, who's a curator and author um, interested in forms of artistic engagement and activism. Um, so, since two thousand and eight, he's been the curator of the Museum Het Domaine. <laughs> in Stittar, <laughs> where he draws attention to artists who deal with political or social is issues, interested in gender questions, functioning as bridge makers between different cultures. Um, and he's been working for a long time with Mark um, on various different exhibitions. And most recently, I have this brick <laughs> called The Incomplete Writings of Mark Dion, which has very recently been published and uh, is this is a kind of unofficial book launch for it here in London. I have to say it's a very beautiful book that covers Mark's writing, edited by rule, covering Mark's writing and projects from the last 30, mid, since the mid 80s up till now. Um, and not only chronicling some of the kind of incredible writings, but also a huge amount of things like un, un, un what's the word? Um, proposals for different projects and unrealized projects and so it's a really amazing chronicle of, of 30 years of thinking and uh, ideas that I highly recommend. <laughs> so finally I'm going to introduce somebody who isn't actually here yet. Um, <laughs> but we're not worried about that. Um, so Victor Wind is also going to speak this afternoon. Um, and he's an artist, um, many people may know him in London from his project, The Last Tuesday Society, which has been on uh, Mayor Street in Hackney for, for the last kind of 10 years or so. Um, but he's also a, an artist who works very much in the field of relational aesthetics. He's a kind of writer, collector, dealer, naturalist, antiquarian. Um, so, his, so in terms of The Last Tuesday Society, he, he describes it as being a, an experiment in relational aesthetics. So it's a shop space on Mare Street in Hackney, where he's put on over 500 literary salons, curated 40 art exhibitions, uh, conducted seances, workshops, and of course, his parties. Um, so we're hoping that he's going to arrive any minute now. Um, <laughs> Now, so the, the format of this afternoon is that Mark is going to introduce his work a tiny bit, and then Rule is going to talk about some of the bigger questions that he's been looking at in terms of both working with Mark and his wider um, practice around collections. And then Victor's going to uh, introduce uh, a new latest project of his, and then hopefully the three of them are going to have a bit of a kind of conversation, and there'll be time for some questions and thinking together as well. So I'm going to hand over to Mark. I'm really sick. <laughs> so I feel like I'm speaking to you from the bottom of a fishbowl filled with concrete. So, but um, my senses are returning, so uh, I'm going to try, I'm going to do my best. So I think uh, I want to talk a little bit about collecting from the aspect of an artist who uses collections first and foremost. So someone who is collecting is sort of part of the practice, which means essentially shopping is part of the practice. So I always say, you know, some people paint, some people take photographs, some draw, some sculpt, but I, of course, shop, you know, and that, that is my medium. And uh, so that's something that I'm always very conscious of, but of course that's the, not the only collection I have, and that's not the only reason I collect. And I, I think like most artists, they are, they're people who collect for themselves, and some of those collections can, uh, can be really illuminating in terms of their practice. So if you think about the collections of Hannah Darbova, and I think those reflect um, in, a, in a very kind of surprisingly generous way to her work, uh, in a sense. Um, and I, I think that that's very true for many of the sort of artist collectors. Uh, and then, of course, 
as a as someone who is out all the time, you know, hitting every possible flea market, uh, um, going to every, in America we have these giant antique malls, sorting through these things in secondhand shops and junk stores, uh, there are parallel collections. So I'm always um, looking for very specific things to, to use in my various installations and tableaus and, and environmentally Im immersive pieces. Uh, and at the same time, I'm also collecting for myself because I am also someone who has private collections of unusual things like wooden mallets and oil cans and finials and Victorian photographs and photographs that people have taken at zoos uh, and um, 19th century natural history books and 20th century field guides and um, and margarine um, figurines, and I I could kind of go on, but so <laughs> so uh, so while I'm shopping at, uh, uh, for my projects, I'm also that's also something I'm filling in, and also at the same time I'm collecting for my friends, and I have friends who are the the um, you know they're the kind of people you can't really just pop into um, a Walmart and buy them a present, you know they are very particular and they have uh, particular interests so I have for instance a friend who has a collection of 7,000 brushes and that collection is growing and growing and growing and I have a friend who collects uh, very tattered and tarnished uh, velvet boxes and so so I'm constantly also hunting, or and one who collects doll dresses, and one who collects horse figurines, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, um, th that's kind of very much how I spend my time. And as an as an artist, I work with a lot of people. I need assistance from people to help me produce things. So I work with very talented people who can make watercolors for me, who can. Uh, sculpt and make furniture for me, people who uh, build my cabinetry. Uh, and uh, at the same time, it's impossible to get someone to shop for you, to find things for you. The kind of uh, complexity of the, uh, and, and the kind of nuance it takes to understand what is the right, what, um, what is the right patina, what is the right, um, um, nuance to um, to a particular thing is is very difficult. So often when I start a project, people say, "Give us a list of what you want," and that's such an incredibly difficult thing to explain to them that that's really not how it works. And uh, in the same way that um, that they say, "Oh, when you go to the flea market, do you have a list?" Someone who brings a list to a flea market really isn't understanding how <laughs> flea markets function. It's not, it's not the grocery store, right? Uh, so it's not about what you want to find. It's, it's uh, that, it, that's there. It's about what's there that you want to find. So um, I'm just going to show a couple projects. How does this work now? If I press this, will something happen? Yes. Um, yes. Oh, look at that. So this is the outside of a piece called Memory Box. And Memory Box um, relates very much to one of my first uh, encounters with things and, and it's something that, that built in me a kind of affection and a kind of a belief that things have meaning and, th and that they have um, evocative power. Was I, I grew up in uh, New England uh, in, the, in the 1960s. I was a child. And in these neighborhoods I lived in, there were remnants of an earlier time when, for instance, people used to keep chickens in their backyards. So there were these tar paper chicken coops um, in people's yards that had become disused, and very often they became a place where one would store the lawnmower or something like that. But sometimes they became these um, uh, places where people would have their workshops and they would keep their tools or they would keep their strange things and uh, and uh, because we were children we could fit through the 
chicken entrances, which, <laughs> which, which, were, which were still there. So, so you could kind of slide open the chicken door and crawl inside these spaces that would be darkened, and of course there would be paper wasp nests above, and the light would pour through, and then you would see this wall of mysteries, this wall of tools, and very often there would be cigar boxes full of nuts and bolts, or keys, or pocket knives, and you know, just these kind of places that felt like, you know, this was a kind of interesting dime store alchemy, right? So, um, so I wanted to make a piece that is, was very much evocative of that experience, and so, here you see my friend Pericles there for scale, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and this is a, a work that uh, one enters, and inside you are confronted with hundreds of boxes, right? And, and uh, it's hard to tell, but there, there's, in many cases, there's two layers of boxes. And in these boxes are really quite, I think, quite marvelous things. Mm -hmm. So, um, minerals and shells and, um, and old, um, jewelry and strange toys and card games and optical games and um, um, just all sorts of things. Things that I had accumulated over many, many years of going to the flea market and trying just to find um, remarkable small things. Um, so, um, and the idea is, is usually one, two or three people can enter this space and you're allowed to open these boxes. The boxes made of tin, boxes made of cardboard, uh, wooden boxes, cigar boxes, plastic boxes, uh, and not always easy to open. Uh, and sometimes inside I've sort of um, arranged things in a, in a kind of like a kind of object poems, gluing things. Uh, in so they have a particular relationship. Other times things are very loose. Some things have great value. Some things have uh, very small value. Some things are numerous. Sometimes they'll be an uh, isolated object. Uh, some objects, of course, um, uh, being mysterious, uh, uh, enigmatic. It's really hard to tell what what exactly they are. The cootie box does have the cootie game in it. With And you know, I was very much inspired by um, this is this is the Utopia Parkway um, studio of Joseph Cornell, right? So, uh, looking at the way Cornell is storing his objects and his materials, uh, thinking very much, you know, as much as you know, marvelous as Cornell's are in a way, we we don't interact with them in the way that they were meant to be interacted with. Those boxes were meant to be held. Uh, you know, there are balls in them and there are rings on sticks because those were supposed to be played with and those were supposed to have a kind of um, uh, movement and gravity to them that, uh, that was very much in Cornell's uh, 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 sense when he was making them. And now, of course, these things often sit very static. They often sit with their backs to the wall so you can't see that they have uh, three-dimensionality. Uh, and, and that's not in, in a way that, the way that they were intended to be. But also, I just love to see this kind of uh, thing. So, so this is an image that I've known about you know, since the beginnings of studying art and, and has always kind of resonated with me as something, you know, as, as wonderful as a Cornell box is, how wonderful Cornell's studio must have been. And, and how can I, in some way, encapsulate that experience of materiality uh, that that studio might, uh, that a visit to that studio might have entailed. Uh, so to try to cr recreate that or create it in a, um, in a somewhat theatrical uh, uh, aspect is what this is. So in, that, in, the, in the memory box is also a little table where you can take things and put them onto the table and then open them up, in this case it's a box of sea creatures, a box of very rude noisemakers from kind of Mardi Gras, 
a box of dead mice in alcohol. Uh, <laughs> I, I do live in New York City, so I have unlimited access to dead mice. <laughs> So for, I mean, this is like for museum registrars, this, this is like a nightmare come true, yeah. right? So um, you have to, when making a piece like this, there, there is, has to be a degree of acceptable loss, right? Things are, people are going to steal things. You know, I mean, not very often, but it happens. There are, there are very valuable things in there, so sometimes those things goes missing. People are going to break things. These boxes are very old. You, you know, if you drop a box like that, it really does explode. And so, uh, so there has to be a certain kind of maintenance level to this. So I, I just had to, I, I show this um, work for, the, for my retrospective at the ICA in Boston, and we made like an additional 25 boxes that could replace the other boxes. So at the end of the day, um, the team have to go back and reset this piece, um, trying to put back the boxes more or less where they are, because no one will put boxes back where they found them for some reason. But, so I, I think that, that you know, the, the interactivity of a work like this is really successful and it's, and it's a big hook, but also it does add a level of commitment to the institution um, in, uh, in showing something like this. A lot of the collections that I work with um, are, I sometimes I, I'm very much, I'm often asked to organize someone's collection or to articulate their collection. So, and as much as we always think about museums as collecting institutions, I'm often asked by universities which are collecting institutions even if they don't know they are, right? So, um, universities of course have official collections, right? They have scientific collections. You, you can't, um, you know, you can't teach geology if you don't have a collection of rocks and minerals, right? You can't teach music if you don't have a collection of instruments. So there are those kind of collections. And then there are uh, the, the kind of collections that are the museum, the university's own heritage, their archives, uh, um, things that are collected very intentionally because they want, uh, because they bureaucratically need to keep these things and also tell their own story. There are the unofficial collections, people's Hello Kitties that they have on their desks, so and then there are the collections of technologies that become uh, too old to throw away. So the microscope that is obsolete and should be thrown out but gets put in the closet instead and then 50 years later it's recognized as an important historical object. So, uh, and uh, um, I was invited to, do, to be part of this very large project called Weltwissen, World Knowledge, and it was about 300 years of science uh, in Berlin. So starting with the development of Charité Hospital, the first teaching hospital in Berlin 300 years ago. So the exhibition was full of very rigorous um, uh, exhibitions about science in Berlin from the perspective of the sciences, um, chemistry, mathematics, the contribution, um, exhibits about the perversion of science under National Socialism, and all you know, and about um, uh, the development of the social sciences. So, very, very uh, thorough exhibition about these topics. But what they needed was something to kind of open the door. So they asked me to come and help them create a kind of um, kind of wonder camera entrance. So these are objects from the, all of the different departments of science within the university, and as far as I can tell, science is everything except literature, music, and art in, um, in the universities in Berlin. But you don't enter this piece th looking at it this way, but rather you enter it this way. So you enter and see the back, so you see these mysterious silhouettes, almost like these kind of platonic ideals of things, but you don't know what those things are. You see, this piece is enormous. Each one of those boxes is um, two by two meters. And then you make your way around, and the cabinet is is actually uh, um, you know a hemisphere, so it is curving uh, vertically and horizontally as well. So it's kind of surrounding you, embracing you. And we start on the left hand side with 
um, um, with cartography and with uh, the earth sciences um, going up to um, microbiology and then uh, and then botany and then um, uh, and then going through all the all the, all the um, biological sciences information science there so yeah we have the, so we have the natural sciences we have humans as animals so medicine history of medicine humans as producers of culture ethnography um, uh, and then we have archaeology, information, um, science, mathematics, engineering, um, um, chemistry, physics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this was, of course, this was incredibly challenging to have to go through all of these collections. Uh, also very challenging because I would have to come in and knock on the door of the professor who is the most knowledgeable Egyptologist in the world and say to her, um, hey, do you have something about Egypt? <laughs> and, you know, could it, could it be maybe like the size of a, of a washing machine? You know, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, a very, and also, while, while some of the sciences, of course, have, they have their own museums and they, and they are, um, it's not hard to find representations of, of art history, for instance, or, or um, representations from the history of medicine, but other sciences being much more abstract and not as well taken care of, uh, it might be very difficult to find things, and they might not be organized in a particular way, so we had to you know, crawl into storerooms under the train station and things like that, where no person has been in a very long time. <coughs> And there were also um, some, um, there are some um, telescopes that you can look at this, and the telescopes are programmed, so if you hit particular objects, they give you the backstory to the objects. So, uh, for instance, this, um, I was going to see if this had a laser pointer on it, does it? Oh, look at that. Yeah. Look at that. Wow. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, this is the emperor's horse, and the emperor Maximilian had this great passion for this horse, so when the horse died, he had the horse um, taxidermied, and that would stand on the left side of the entrance to the castle, and then the skeleton was on the right side, and so when you entered the castle, you would kind of enter between his favorite horse, and so, you, and you have things like the first iron lung, and you have, this is the speaker for Hitler's Nuremberg rally, and so each of those objects have these kind of very, very powerful um, backstories as well. More conventionally working with museums, um, which have collections, you know, the big part of their problem with their collections is that they show only between 1 and 10 percent of what they actually have, right? So most of the things are in storage. So uh, very often um, they want to get things out of these cardboard boxes in the basement where they're not really doing anyone any good. So this is actually the Oceanographic Museum in Monaco, which was built in 1910. Needless to say, in 1910, this is not the obvious way one would build something, right? There's, modernism is quite, uh, m quite moving on in 1910, but the Prince Albert of Monaco wanted to build a temple for the ocean that was the marriage of art and science. And so he looked to... Um, the um, German evolutionary biologist Ernst Haeckel and his book Art Forms in Nature as the, uh, as the model for how to build this. And so all of his gargoyles are not really gargoyles or angels, they're sea eagles and, uh, and there's a walrus and then the gates are the tentacles of octopi and the, the chandeliers in this place are, are um, jellyfish, Medusa jellyfish from Ernst Hegel's designs, and the sconces are in the shapes of seahorses. So it's really a fantastically um, um, uh, ornate space. Um, and so, the, and also, the, the, as the king of Monaco, he was in charge of the state, in charge of the military, whatever, whatever that may mean. Uh, he was also uh, is responsible for the casinos, and he was 
all of that, he was also a, um, a very decent cetacean taxonomist. He was a whale systematics expert. So whenever he had free time, he would sail out on his research vessel with climatologists, oceanographers, and marine biologists, and they would survey the Azores and the Arctic, um, capturing animals, doing deep sea animal surveys, uh, sending up kites to sample the stratosphere. So he, w he, you know, he was a kind of gentleman scientist. So that this building was made for that. And so here's his building. So the first, these two floors are museum. This is aquarium, and then there's seven stories underground of ocean oceanographic laboratories and then of course coming out to where the ship would be parked and so um, so this is really kind of putting your money where your mouth is in a sense this is what it looked like in 1910 this is the hall of um, vertebrate marine biology this is the hall of oceanography so of course whatever they invent whatever they made to sample the ocean to collect organisms from the deep sea, they had to invent. So these were all novel things. So they also use them all, the, they exhibit all the compressors and the nets and the trolling nets and the traps and the kites and things like that. This was his favorite, of course, the hull of the whale. So later, this became um, under the management of the great uh, environmentalist, the great environmental filmmaker Jacques Cousteau, uh, you know, wonderful um, advocate for uh, ocean health. Um, here he is with Grace Kelly and whatever his name is. And, um, and as wonderful as Cousteau was, as important as Cousteau is as a figure, I might suggest that he was perhaps not the best museum director or museum designer. So all of those kind of fabulous old spaces that you saw were destroyed to make kind of push-button 1970s didactic environmental exhibits. So not so great. So now the museum is trying in a way, even though they continue to deal with contemporary issues of ocean health and, and conservation, and they're very, very committed to these ideas. They're trying to bring back the sense of the historic, the importance of the historic museum as well. They are very much a museum of a museum, um, and, a, and of that, uh, uh, the imperative that the museum first had. They invited me to put a lot of my own works in the context of the museum, but since my own works look so much like the museum, it's really hard. To, it's really hard to tell what is my work and what's the museum, which which is fine for me. And so, but more importantly, they wanted me to help them with this idea, like, how can we show more? And what we're not showing is really our own story. And so, I helped them by designing an enormous cabinet, um, and. Um, my wife and I spent a good amount of time, about two years, searching through the collections, trying to find the best of the best of what they're not showing uh, in terms of both um, biology and, and, um, and culture and, and scientific instrumentation. And then we built this, the Oceanomania Cabinet, which is now the sort of permanent introduction to the museum on the second floor. So this has um, at the very bottom, you have a collection of publications. This institution has, from the beginning, been very devoted to scientific publications, and they still do scientific publications. Here we have the uh, exhibit of the small collections, things that they wouldn't, you would probably never see in the museum, like their bryzoa and things like this. And then here we have, uh, they have an enormous collection of art made of animal, of, of marine animal, uh, products, so mother of pearl, coral, uh, all of this kind of stuff. And then we have scientific instrumentation. Then we have here wet specimens, usually from various expeditions. So one cabinet will contain all the wet specimens from, say, Cousteau's Amazon expedition. So this side, um, somewhat archaic natural objects. These things are from the history of the museum itself, including the Calypso. Albert's boat, uh, and then here we have lots of art and artifacts. So 
this is a way of kind of looking backward toward the to the cabinet of wonder methodology but moving the museum forward by allowing it to, to be able to tell its own story through this presentation okay so anyway i i also wanted to say <laughs> it is it is really great for me to be back at delphina and and uh i do feel very honored to have had this very long relationship first with delphina studios and now with the delphina foundation and the people here at Delphine have always been welcoming and welcomed me to a number of their luncheon events. And so, um, and, um, and Aaron, thank you so much for continuing to support this project um, at the Whitechapel. And it's just been a great um, opportunity for me to kind of check in with old friends. Roll, I'm going to give you the microphone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. <laughs> um, it was a great presentation. Uh, this is another uh, PowerPoint, but not mine. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, thank you. Okay, I need three hands now. Um, uh, so. Uh, thank you so much for hosting me, uh, for inviting me here. Um, I'm incredibly pleased to be part of the of this program. Um, when I was thinking about notions of collecting and notions of uh, private collecting, notions of public uh, collecting, um, I'm, I'm familiar with both uh, of, the, of these. Uh, tendencies. I was thinking, uh, like, what um, what for me is quintessential about uh, it, it, it collecting, and for me, what's what's incredibly thought provoking is that, in a way, you start collecting artists uh, who are collecting institutions who are collecting private people who are collecting, and one by one, with little by little, one. Um, one starts to clutter the building <laughs> and um, in a way it takes over and it gets more and more. Um, you need an additional storage and at some point the additional storage uh, won't do anymore. Um, and what, what I find incredibly interesting is that at some point um, collecting becomes some sort of way of placemaking. In a way, um, the collection becomes a location, becomes a place, um, becomes a site. Uh, and I, th um, I, I just uh, um, uh, brought this slide. Um, some of you who, who have been uh, uh, to the Netherlands may know it. Um, I had to think uh, of one of the places which are incredibly dear uh, to me still and where in a way my uh, passion for art was born um, uh, the Hoge Veluwe in, in uh, the Netherlands the place where uh, the Kruller Müller Museum is, is housed um, which was literally um, a kind of off place where no one went there there was an art critic uh, when um, Helene Kruller Müller, uh, the German collector who settled uh, together with her husband in the, in the Netherlands, when she decided to buy land there and, and they bought almost uh, 6,000 hectares uh, of, of, of land there and it was only kind of like a kind of desert of um, of sand and art critics at the time in the, the 1920s, 1930s were writing um, that uh, this collector, Helene Kruller Müller, uh, would have sand in her head to build a museum in such an incredible, weird, uh, off location in the middle, in the, in the center of the Netherlands at the time without a lot of um, public transport or whatever and 
um, ask, for instance, uh, the Dutch architect H.P. Berlach, you see it in the, in the, in the rear of the, of the photograph, in the background of the photograph, to build her house there, uh, the, um, uh, based on the, uh, on the legend of St. Hubert, uh, St. Hubertus Slot. Um, a kind of Dutch um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright follower, um, but she made this incredible, uh, built this incredible collection, uh, and at the heart of it, it uh, there, there is a collection of 280 uh, Vincent van Gogh uh, works, and she was the first to choose, and all the leftovers ended up in the Van Gogh Museum, but she uh, had the first choice from the um, from the brother of, of, of Vincent van Gogh. Um, but f for me, it's kind of like, um, I really like this notion of collecting as placemaking. And at some point, uh, the collection becomes a physical, tangible site where you could go. This is another more contemporary example. Uh, near uh, Dusseldorf in, in, in Neuss, um, in the Ruhr area in Germany, uh, where a private collector, uh, Karl, Heinrich, uh, Karl Heinrich Müller, um, housed his own collection. And a kind of very weird collection, very different fields um, of, of collect, uh, collections, uh, paintings, but also kind of prehistorical uh, sculptures. And he had um, some uh, local artist, uh, Erwin Herig, a, a pupil of Joseph Beuys, uh, who designed these kind of pavilions in which uh, the art is housed. And what's incredibly weird and in a way also very painful um, is that there's very few air conditioning or a kind of nothing has been managed in terms of climate control, humidity. So all these kind of Hans Arp paintings, um, uh, Bart van der Leck uh, sketches, Cezanne uh, watercolors are almost uh, hanging there in, in outdoor <laughs> conditions where it, 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 there, there's a roof on top of it. Um, but as far as I know, there's no heating, there's no climate control, there's nothing. Uh, so in a way, it's also, there's an ele element of vanity there which makes it quite intense and also quite interesting, I would say. Um, an example that you may all be very familiar with here in the UK, um, an artist I, I'm, I'm incredibly fond of, uh, Ian Hamilton Finlay, who in uh, Dunsire, uh, Scotland, um, collected his own work in a way, or little by little, um, not traveling a lot, or actually for a long time um, really disliking the, the notion of travel. Little by little, little built Little Sparta, um, a kind of reserve is, is I think, a euphemism. Um, it's quite, quite a hostile, it's almost like a closed bastion where the, out, uh, the, 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 the outdoor world <laughs> would be kept outdoor <laughs> and um, uh, starting to, to erect structures. Um, here's the temple of Apollo um, and the whole garden has been filled with his own sculpture uh, uh, partly created um, on site or, or for, um, uh, for that site. Incredible place, very, very dense actually. The art is really, really kind of very close to another. Um, and again, for me, these are the places which are incredibly dear to me. And if I kind of need to think about differences between private collectors and public uh, collections, for me, it's very often the private collectors who brought together kind of very radical, sometimes I would say almost manic, uh, kind of <laughs> collections, um, in a way, being able to specialize to an extent that a public institution would never be allowed uh, uh, to, to specialize in a way, to really follow an artist over a long, long uh, period of time, or only buying one artist or one 
uh, group of artists. Uh, one of the models for me, in, in a way, um, in terms of private and, and, and public collecting, um, is the, bo the so-called Boys Block in, in Germany, in Darmstadt. Um, I don't know if any one of you is familiar with it or has been there. Um, a German industrialist, uh, Karl Ströher, um, started to purchase works by Joseph Beuys in the late 60s. He started to buy one entire exhibition of Joseph Beuys um, in, the, in the late 60s and afterwards uh, had a contract with Beuys where he would uh, fund Beuys, he, he would uh, donate uh, a, a particular amount of money each year to boys and uh, in um, it, and they made a kind of deal that this collector would have first choice from the the, the artistic output of boys each year so boys he, he kept um, adding works to the uh, collection all the time boys uh, was incredibly much focused on how his work would be uh, presented um, and little by little they built um, what's now um, called the boys block um, one group of works by boys which is still housed in the same rooms in the same museum in Darmstadt <coughs> where boys little by little built uh, this collection presented the collection and uh, in a very particular way uh, unfortunately, it has been renovated in the meantime, and unfortunately, the very beautiful wallpaper, the Utah uh, wallpaper, which is there, disappeared. It's now a white cube presentation, which is, I think, a shame. A lot of boys, uh, lovers, or, 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 or uh, relatives protested against it, but um, a, a number of years ago, they, they changed um, the wall paper, but uh, here I'm showing the original photograph. So there's a kind of th there. This is one of the first spaces, quite quite empty. Um, this is the second space you enter, where everything is really cluttered. Um, you really have a physical uh, relationship when you're kind of almost crawling and almost stepping on works, or you, you have to uh, step on on pieces of felt and, and copper etc. when you cross these uh, pieces. It's, there's the element of smell, uh, all, all these kind of um, aspects. And for, for me these are incredible presentations which wouldn't have been there if a public institution um, would only collect because a public institution is never allowed or n it always needs to kind of justify um, it's, it's purchasing policy and, and can't specialize to such an extent in, uh, on the work of one artist. But for me, if I kind of need to think like what's um, uh, kind of collaborations between collectors and, and artists, these for me are really quintessential uh, places. Um, so here we are entering the third room. Oh, ooh, the Beamer doesn't like it, thinks it's too likes, long, likes it too much. <laughs> <laughs> getting really excited or the battery is gone. Okay, there we are again. I hear an odd noise, I don't know what, somehow it's protesting. No. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Try again? Yeah. yeah, okay, wonderful. The fat stool, um, a piece um, which, which, which Boyce did in several versions, and in the end he changed it for this version, which he considered the best one, or at least the collector did. One of the next spaces with vitrines really, really close to each other, where you almost kind of need to um, physically move between the vitrines. You're very close to them. Uh, watercolors or drawings behind the vitrines, which you can only see through the vitrines. Um, uh, the vitrines not arranged in a kind of very um, 
structured way, but kind of almost like uh, kind of dynamic kind of clusters. Um, so, and, and it, it, br it brings me to Mark's work, because for, for me, <laughs> it, it, it's, a big, it's a big leap, uh, perhaps. Um, but I was like um, uh, yeah, trying to make a kind of link like um, these kind of collector's museums. And I think um, Mark is an artist, um, but he's also a collector. Uh, I would say um, I brought, I basically brought um, installation views of the exhibition we did in Sittard, the Netherlands. It's an old little museum in the south of the Netherlands, close to Maastricht. And um, you could say not a very prestigious, huge institution, not a lot of budget, um, but the really nice thing and the kind of way I really like to work in, in such a place is to work incredibly close with the artist and trying to develop a really site-specific project for that little weird museum. Um, in the meantime, we changed the building, but this was still in the old 19th century building, which was originally built as a school uh, for children. And all the walls there are basically wooden walls. And uh, if an artist wants to take out a wall, it, it was possible. If an artist wants to um, have, uh, like an exhibition we did with Koen van Mechelen, uh, wants to have a camel um, in the museum, it was possible. Um, and on the courtyard during the day. So it's kind of the, 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 the really nice thing. And what I, th uh, what I really like about these smaller institutions is that you kind of try to work closely with an artist to facilitate um, really radical presentation strategy where you really try to kind of uh, together develop something. Um, this show um, which we did with, with Mark in 2013 um, was called the, Ma the Macabre Treasury, which was uh, more or less the first retrospective uh, concise retrospective of Mark's work in the Netherlands. He had, uh, had uh, earlier solo exhibitions, smaller exhibitions. Um, and we rebuilt the whole museum basically for that show. So the whole museum was transformed into one Kunst und Wunderkammer. Uh, this is the entrance to the first room of the exhibition. Mark designed um, rooms. Um, each room had its own color, had its own theme, and each room you entered had its own door, de designed by Mark um, and, and, and built at the museum at the time. This is the zoology department, uh, which you entered first uh, as a visitor. Uh, this is a view through um, that, that kind of zoo uh, kind of door. Uh, so there, there's also a very active, there was a very active element in the show because you needed to open a door each time you entered a new <coughs> space. Um, so, so this is a view in, again, it's blocking. Oh, it's me, perhaps. Um, uh, so this is the, the view of the zoology department where we all, uh, where we had a lot of works relating to animals. I'm, I'm just, sorry, <laughs> if you want to correct me. <laughs> But I'm just trying to uh, give you a brief tour of that show um, because I, I think it, it's such an incredible radical presentation strategy and I think you're not really a white cube artist and I, I, we basically rebuilt the whole museum for uh, that show. Um, so here's in the center piece which we purchased also for the museum collection, Iceberg and Palm Trees, uh, which has to do with climate change. And here you can see the next door of the next space, uh, the Bureau of Museums and the Culture of Collections. And if you uh, went through that door, uh, you entered in a yellow space uh, where you had all kind of pieces which related to notions of collecting. Um, um, this incredible piece, I'm sorry for the quality of the image. Um, um, National Botanical Survey, Coastal Collection, an incredible piece where Mark basically sent 
parcels to a German collector, um, Carola Kraus, uh, which remained unopened. Um, so it's quite, it's quite enigmatic what's in the parcels, uh, which he um, uh, collected in the course of time. And if you look in the background here, you see the next door to the next space. Um, and th uh, that, uh, there you really needed to crawl to get in. And there was the underworld world hall with glow-in-the-dark objects um, relating to different fields of, of human inquiry, uh, different sciences, belief systems. And um, there was a cabinet of mystery, which I don't have um, uh, pictured here. This is the door which you uh, entered if you entered the, ar the room of archaeology. Um, the blue room with all pieces relating to notions of, of archaeology uh, gathering objects. Here's an, an, a piece called uh, uh, A Tale of Two Seas, um, where um, Stefan Dillemat and um, uh, Mark Dying collected objects along the coast of the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. Again, pieces and uh, uh, works with many, many different pieces. Mark told me that his ICA show took, I think, three weeks to deinstall. We had kind of similar, <laughs> <laughs> similar problems in Sittard at the time. Um, and this is uh, one of the, uh, this was one of the last spaces of the exhibition, um, the hunting saloon uh, with all pieces related to hunting notion and debate about hunting. Very touching piece here on the right hand side which was um, uh, commented about uh, a lot, uh, all uh, photographs of hunters with their prey, basically male hunters. And in the background you see uh, pieces from the museum's own collection which Mark also integrated in the show. And these are guns um, an, uh, 18th and 19th century guns for hunting for women. So there's a meal, uh, there's a gender debate going on in the in the hunting saloon. Um, this is a piece, and I'm I'm ending here, uh, which you will see back uh, at the White Chapel in a few days. Um, Costume Bureau, um, which is another piece from our collection. It was the first piece we purchased at the time, uh, documenting four different actions which Mark did in the course of time, uh, amongst which the, the Thames dig, um, with which you're, I think, all familiar, um, which you will see in the White Chapel show. But um, I think I'll, I'll keep, um, I'll, I'll keep the, the, the guided tour here. For, for me, um, it's kind of, yeah, I, I can't help making some promotion. Uh, or telling a little bit because um, that show was 2013 and basically then we started to work on um, what was in a way also part of the whole project, a book of artist writings. F it, uh, we ended up with a book of 544 pages. Um, when we started <laughs> we had the idea of making a textbook then Mark insisted it should be lavishly illustrated. Um, so we ended up with 544 full color pages and then we had the funding problem, <laughs> which we solved by publishing a really beautiful portfolio of prints. I, I have it with me, it doesn't make any sense to show it. Uh, perhaps you, you won't manage to see it, but if uh, you want to see it, I can uh, display it later if you want. Um, the book is incredible. Um, I must say, almost 100 interviews, artist texts, manifestos, uh, texts which belong or are part of artworks, uh, very often previously not published, um, a lot of images which were not published yet. Um, so a lot, lot of materials. Um, collected and, and in a way for me also kind of relating to the notion of collecting. For me it's very much, I'm always very much interested in artists who have very, who develop very strong world views or who develop a very strong cons consistent view 
kind of almost alternative view of how we can approach the world. And I think uh, for me, an, an artist like Joseph Beuys is, is, is someone uh, like that. And Ian Hamilton Finley uh, was such an artist. And for me, Mark is very, very much uh, such an artist. And um, I think reading um, the texts really helps to kind of further um, yeah, dive into the work and also develop, um, discover some aspects which you may not um, uh, have seen or, or if you just saw the actual physical works. To finish my marketing yes. uh, <laughs> talk, <laughs> on the Eurostar train this morning I managed to bring 18 books, 30 kilos, um, which uh, are here. <laughs> and I don't want to bring them back. <laughs> in, in case you would be interested, um, I'll leave this display copy here in um, at the entrance area so that you can have a look. And um, I can offer them, I think they're normally 45 euros, I can offer them here for 30 pounds if you would be interested. And I think Mark is very much willing to sign your copy if you want to. So you're most uh, uh, welcome if you want to, after the event, to um, purchase a copy and have, have it signed by Mark. Thank you so much for your interest. Hello. Um, sorry that I'm, I'm late. I had, a, I had to drive from... I live in Suffolk, and I had a ho horrible journey because the weather was terrible. Um, and on the way, I had an even worse thing. I live in a very rural bit, and I was just coming out down a narrow light lane when I ran over a hare. Oh. And I, I, got, I was very upset because hares... I, I've got keen on hares. Um, I was vegetarian. I don't like, like killing things. And hares are also the sacred animal to the... Kelt. So I got out of the car and when I was holding the hair, so I had to change because I got a bit of blood uh, on the way. Another reason why I was, I was late. And whilst I was doing that, uh, this car pulled up and uh, a woman got out and she really started shouting at me, accusing me of being a hair murderer, which is you know, not much. Um, and she took the hair off me uh, and then she got something out of her bag and she sprinkled it onto the hair and the hair gave a sort of kick so and then it, it gave another kick and then it, it it jumped down and it one of its legs went up as though it was waving and it it ran down the the road and it kept sort of doing this and it went under a five bar gate across the field and every now and again it, its arm would go up like this and I looked at this woman who I said, well, what, what was in that bottle? And she said it was hair restorer with a permanent wave. <laughs> so um, so uh, having missed the beginning, I'm not quite sure what everyone else is talking about. I'm going to talk, <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about a book that I wrote called Victor Wynne's Cabinet uh, of Wonders. And when I, the publishers asked me to write, write, asked me if I'd thought about writing a book about myself, which... Um, I had many times. I, I was delighted, but we didn't have anything other than the um, than the title. Oh, that's going backwards. Um, and also, it meant I had to start thinking about who I was and, and what I did. Um, and I started, in some ways, in the, with the with the Pitt Rivers Museum, because that's where I used to go as a, a child and was um, very happy. Such a, a beautiful collection of. Well, basically, toys, I think. Though I did find that it, it wasn't the right place to go as a teenager and take LSD because <laughs> it was pointless. It was, it was far more sensible to go to the um, go to a public loo because that at least looked like the pit rivers rather than some sort of incredible hell. <coughs> um, 
But the main thing I wanted to start with at the, the Pitt Rivers was the cabinet dedicated to the treatment of the, the dead by their enemies. So I, I wrote to the director of the Pitt Rivers, and I, oh, I didn't set my timer, so just wave. I'm on it. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I said, I explained how influential the Pitt Rivers had been, so that I'd like to come. Uh, especially and to photograph the, the shrunken heads because when I was a child I never thought that I would be um, sleeping with five of them in a jar by my, by my bed. And um, the director wrote back and said he was unable to accommodate my request. And I, I then found out that Pitt Rivers are not very keen on their shrunken heads. and they're not very, Actually, they, it's quite a nice museum in many ways because they don't really want anyone to go to it. It's sort of an <laughs> academic institution. So anything that attracts attention they, they're a bit, bit sniffy about. But I finally, through the help of some friends, said I convinced them that I was really interested in photographing their spoon collection, because they've got all these different spoons from all over the world. Uh, and they said, yes, I could come and photograph that. Um, and then they stuck a curator next to me, like this. So the, and what I did eventually was I said, let's go and have a cup of tea. And we then had a, a competition to see whose bladder was bigger. Uh, I won. But, and this is um, some of my collection of, of, of dead people, from uh, babies in bottles to shrunken heads to, to uh, the skeleton of an 18th century bastard child, um, complete with it, its death certificate. So at, at some point when I, I was, well, really when I started writing the book, I had to think about what, what a collector was. I'd, I'd always assumed that a collector was someone like Pitt Rivers or the Gulbenkians or, or the Rothschilds or you know, one of these people, A, uh, enormously wealthy, but also uh, with, with great cerebral powers. Um, of course, I then, but I thought about it a bit, bit longer, decided, well, no. Um, a collector, I think, really, is, is just someone who's got too much of something, and they've, they've got an, an obsession with it, and also it's got to be something you, you don't need. It's got to be something you don't need, and you've got nowhere to put it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, if you go off, and you, if you've got a couple of, of big houses, and you buy 50 Picasso paintings and hang them on all the walls, you're not a collector, you're, you're, you're decorating them, and that, that's you know, f far more worthwhile. In the same sense, if you own a supermarket, and you've got 100,000 bottles of milk, you're not collecting them, you're working with them. So I think with Mark's case as well, he's not really a collector because everything is part of their tools to a trade. They're not, you know, so anyway, I don't, I've got many thousands of books, but I don't think it's a, a book collection because I, I read them all. I do have a lot of books which have stupid titles like um, How to Help Your Husband Get Ahead by Dorothy Carnegie, A Guide to Faking Exhibition Poultry, um, and various things like that. And I think that that's an, a collection because I, I'm not going to read them. I just, just look at them and laugh. Um, oh, back to shrunken heads. And as part of being a, a collector, I realized it, it had extended to every aspect of my life when I went to buy a, a car because I used to have this rather nice red convertible thing. And it wasn't big enough to put things in, and I, so I went and I got a, a big estate car, but they also had a, a powder blue sort of classic convertible, and I thought, well, I still need a convertible too, so I, I left with that. Uh, and when I had babies, I had, I had twins. Um, oh, backwards. <laughs> and I'm, I'm very eclectic, so in many, perhaps not, you know, Many, most lots of collectors, they'll just collect one thing. They'll collect art, or toy soldiers, or shoes, or handbags, or houses. Um, whereas I really just collect pretty things, which uh, appeal to me. But I've always been fascinated by carnivorous plants. This is me in, in New Guinea um, well, finding some carnivorous plants. I put on the mosquito net thing, because I took it with me, because I thought it would be full of biting things, but I didn't, having spent a lot of time in the Everglades, I didn't think New Guinea was anything to worth to write home about, but I did put it on because I thought it made me look more like an explorer. Yeah. Well. Um, I also, I've always had a lot of um, animals in, in my life, a lot of 
pets as, as, as a child. Um, this is a, a, well, I don't like animals in, in cages. I've now, I say I don't like animals in cages. I've, have I got any? I've, I have got some animals in cages at the moment because I've got a little co colony of, of harvest mice in the kitchen. But as they're only this size, and, the, and as the cage is enormous, I think you feel that they can almost get, lo get lost in it. But this was a, a chameleon that I have, and I, I put it on the, um, this carnivorous plant that was hanging in, the, in my, my sitting room because I had this, this colony of, of fruit flies, uh, which I actually I found um, particularly attractive and beautiful. I, I would sit on the sofa and spend you know, maybe many hours when I hung over or even not hung over, and I'd watch them because it, it was quite amazing the way they fly backwards and forwards in a sort of irregular jagging pattern, but I had a, a flatmate who didn't think she wanted to share her flat with flies. I got the chameleon. It, it didn't work, but it, it kept, um, kept, kept us amused. And of course, the plant didn't eat the fruit flies either. The traps are really, especially the larger traps, uh, they used to describe them as uh, able to eat rodents, but they recently discovered that what they, actually, they are is, is, is portable loose, and they've designed them Especially, so they've got a nice nectar around the top, but the best way to drink it is is to climb into it and sit there and lick the nectar. And the more nectar you provide, the more likely that the rat is going to do a little poo and fertilise it. It's not quite so sexy. As a, that's a Cephalotus polycerus. It's one of my favourite ones. And um, this is my idea of, of, of heaven. It's it's a carnivorous plant nursery and it's quite hard I find it hard to go to somewhere like and not tr try and buy everything but the the good thing is you can you can go to a, a plant nursery and you can more or less less buy everything and if you're used to buying used to collecting anything which may be more collectible like I know pictures or dead animals or cars or something like that you you can leave with one of everything for the you know, the cost of a <laughs> almost of a, of, of a spare tire, um, and then I, I again thinking about all the things that I I collected, and I've got a I have a museum in East London. Some of you might have been to, which is full. I have a uh, a house in the country, which is full. I have a barn that is full. I have have storage units that is full. And when you when you you, know, you buy something like a especially if, you, if you're buying it as a as a collector, not with anywhere to, to put it, you, you, know, you buy a picture. Yeah, sometimes you, you know, if you're feeling ambitious, you, you pick it up or you, you get it delivered, and, and sometimes you, you leave it in, in storage because it's, it's just it's nice to know you own it. Um, and that's the sort of pleasure you've got somewhere at the back of your mind. You, you know you've got something that you've seen. Maybe you might have seen it recently, you might not have done it. It's still very satisfying because I, I have lots of things that um, I haven't seen for a long time, and I'm very pleased that I've I've got them, um, but the great thing with, with plants is they're the sort of they are the gift that um, that keeps on giving because you you've got to attend to them regularly, um, and then they they change and they, they multiply and and they flower, um, and I also I'm, I'm very keen on orchids, but I'm far less from with orchids as they, they most orchids require a, a huge amount of, of time, um, most carnivorous plants require very little time. All they need is a is a greenhouse which in this country doesn't need to be heated if you to grow about half of them um, and to stand in in rainwater so you don't have to worry about overwatering them or underwatering them uh, that's my hedgehog who has um called gilbert he was very grumpy he has he's since died but you you can visit him in in my museum um and um so i've Difficulty collecting living animals. So I, have, I have a large collection of uh, of dead animals that, in in general, are, are, are much easier to, to look after. Uh, and when the moth gets into them and, and destroys them, it's much less upsetting than when you uh, have a a favourite pet or something else or an animal which you're looking after that that, that dies. And they're also they can be sold again. There are things that I have that um, is a, a different aspects to the, to the longing to, to to own things. There are there are sort of striking holes in, inside you that or inside me that I, I, 
I, I know that I, I'm not complete until I have something. I, for example, I could never imagine life that didn't uh, involve an elephant skull. It's just not 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 possible. Um, that I, I, well, and to sort of misquote Dali, every day needs an, an elephant skull. Uh, freaks, things with two heads or bloated skulls or, or extra legs. I, I do find them interesting, but it, it's part of my box ticking. I feel that I I need to have that, and once I've I've got it, I, I move on. And perhaps tellingly, I've, I've probably got about fifteen or sixteen of them. I don't have any of them at home. I wanted. I normally give a a long sort of rant on the on the futility of of collecting art and how it's one of the the silliest things to to collect. I'm not sure this is the right audience, um, so I'll 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 condense it. As a a collector, or one of the main reasons for many people for collecting is the the appeal of the the rare uh, 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 and the unique. And there is very little that is rare or or unique about art, especially contemporary art. If you go to an art fair like Freeze or Art Basel, you'll see I don't know, a couple of hundred galleries, each gallery representing what 15, 30 artists who each you know have a, a studio, uh, workshop, factory, uh, churning stuff out, which is primarily churned out to be sold in these things that resemble nothing more than a, a giant um, supermarket um, or handbags. But there's something very satisfying about having things. This is a, a part of my, my childhood obsession, um, or my teenage obsession was with an artist called Leonora Carrington. And for a, a long time in my, my late teens, my 20s, I was fixed with this ambition that one day I would get hold of maybe a, a small drawing or, or, or a small print by, by Leonora Carrington. Um, and when the Museum of Modern Art in Dublin wanted to do a retrospective, they, they got in touch with me and I said, yes, I, I've got some graphic works. Um, and I went and I looked and I ended, I ended up, actually I got 30 pieces of them. But I never actually hung them up. Uh, this is, they've just come back, which is why they're, <laughs> they're out. So, Alistair Gray, move on quickly. Um, I did actually want to say something about the, um, the joys of mess. There's a, there's a, a lot of people who, um, I think I, I would feel that I'm a sort of embittled minority that I have to, to justify the fact that I, I'd rather that everything wasn't neat and ordered and that you know, things don't all need to have an, a, a place where they live and the, uh, a shirt is just as happy on the floor as it is in the wardrobe, uh, that the, the washing up doesn't need to be done until the flies car more until the cleaner. I used to have a cleaner who came every two weeks and that was fine. She could spend a lot of time uh, washing up. Um, yeah, I mean, this is um, my desk and, and lots of uh, people look at that and say, well, that's obviously a, you know, you have a, a, a confused and, and disordered mind. How can you get anything done? But then I, I look at their desk, which is empty, and I, I wonder what that says about, <laughs> about their mind. But the main problem with this is that, is that we're, we're losing because we had to, or at least I had to stand here and justify it. Whereas you go into a, a neat and tidy person's house, they don't need to justify it. They're not like, ooh, you know, you don't go there and say, ooh, I better take my shoes off. I don't want to <laughs> get a little bit of dirt on this, this carpet. Um, um, artist studios are very rarely, well, I think. You know, there might be some artist studios that are very neat and clean, and they probably reflect the, the dullness of the, the work that is, 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 is done in, inside them. Uh, this is a, a collector's home, and you can see that there's, um, there's a skeleton of an extinct mower, there's a skeleton of an extinct penguin, um, and I, I think they look much nicer displayed. Well, they certainly appeal to me a lot more when they're displayed like that than they would if they were individually cased in a sterile environment. Yeah, this is in uh, in Darren Brown's house where he obviously likes playing with Lego, but I like playing with with Lego too. And I've recently rediscovered that I've got, I've got little children, but I, even if they weren't there, I, I think I could 
well, quite often I'm still playing with the Lego when they when they <laughs> moved on to the next uh, next uh, enjoyment. What I I wanted to say something briefly about the idea because some come to work. The idea that the that the the most successful collector is is the greatest um, artist uh, of them all. Um, it's an entirely tendentious um, argument. But I'm also reminded of perhaps I introduced some students with, with Mark very kindly brought round to my museum last week by saying that I, I felt that in many ways I'm one of his uh, illegitimate children without, I spent a lot of time at art school st studying his work and it imprinted uh, many things on me. I remember I think there's an interview with you somewhere where you say that um, um, you think museums are uh, uh, an art form like, uh, like novel writing or, or painting. Um, and I think it's much more difficult because you're involved in many more, more things. But as a, as a collector creating something, you know, you're not, you're, you're, your palette is, is, is the space and your, your paint is, is the object that you put in. But it, it's very difficult to... I very rarely go to someone's house or a museum and I think that that's an, an amazing display, it's an amazing way to put it. I normally think it's a, it's a bit boring and I could do it better uh, myself. Uh, but there are places, this is in um, Snows Hill Manor that you might know in the, in the Cotswolds. Uh, and this is um, now uh, moved, uh, Malpeckett House or up Mile End Road, which has now gone to Bedfordshire. Um, that's my, well, it was my dining room table, but it, it slowly <laughs> gathered more and more things as I, as I came in, and I, I eventually decided the only way to have a, a dining table was to have a folding one. Um, and then eventually the, the only way to have a dining table was to go to my next door neighbour whenever I wanted to, I know, and borrow one, um, and um, then find out how much they might, might like for it. I'd quickly end going through a few of my favourite things, dead things in bottles, um, bazoas, a hairball from a cow's stomach, uh, Napoleon's death mask, a couple of anteaters. Um, what's, uh, what's that, one of the masks? An elephant skull, I say. I love elephant skulls, especially in summer. I couldn't really do without them. A summer without an elephant skull would be inconceivable to me. Um, Salvador Dali. Um, Deep sea unidentified worm. When I had a, I um, tend to have um, depressive episodes. I actually spent three months just sitting at a desk drawing pictures of worms. Um, school playing cards. And a couple of things I'd like to own, but don't, ending with a, a great orchid. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to invite you guys to come up as well, actually. Thank you very much, all three of you. Feel like no, I'm not going <laughs> to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disappear. Um, I, th I mean, I'm, super, I'm kind of really aware of the time, so I'm not going to ask too many questions. I think let's throw it straight open. Um, but actually, I mean, the, the, the images that you've just ended on, Victor, are kind of, uh, unbeknownst to you, quite close to where we started in some respects. Sorry. Um, and I guess the, the thing that was going through my head a little bit was to ask both of you guys, actually, um, about the relationship in that sense between uh, the idea of the collection and the idea of display and the idea of the natural world. Because there's so much of what the, we're looking at here that seems like, obviously enough, and you were speaking briefly about this idea of like something that's rare and unique and how the work of art isn't that. But then what you're, you're dealing with is botanical or, or animal-based kind of objects. And I guess with Mark, it feels like there's also a kind of thread of environmentalism or activism or an interest in the natural world that really runs through what you're trying to talk about when you're trying to talk about the ways that these collections um, speak to us. I, I think, I mean, there's no, there are no collections of 
the natural world that are actually natural. You know, that, that everything, if we're going to collect it, it's already not part of the natural world. You know, a shell is nothing without the organism, and the shell is nothing without, you know, itself as a, as a creature in an ecology. So immediately by collecting it, it becomes a kind of cultural artifact. And the same could be true for herbaria or for, you know, a, a taxidermy animal is not the animal, right? So these things that are tools for our understanding already, you know, dramatically remove them from the realm of nature, right? So I, I think that that's always, uh, because, you know, I mean, to me, nature is like this sort of process, and part of that process is, uh, is the is the cycling of nutrients, right? The cycling of energy, and uh, once you sort of remove something from that, it is outside of that realm of nature. So, in a way, even though we have this category of natural collections, there's nothing natural in it. In in the same way that there's very little, you know, natural in the the impulse to collect. But is there a? <laughs> Um, but I guess, so the second half of the question then is about about one of the things that I don't think the book needs any more advertising, but one of the things that really came through to me with the book was 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 reading some a lot of these kind of ideas of these manifestos and these ideas of uh, wanting to talk about the environment and wanting to talk about what is happening in the planet and 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 the the kind of environmentalism and the way that you might use the space of the art um, museum to talk about that oh yeah I mean uh, obviously my work has a very I think it, it's, it's not a kind of hidden agenda it's an it's an agenda that is you know promotes biodiversity and um, care and conservation of wild places and wild things and I mean those are those are issues embedded in the work I mean the work is one big attempt to understand how we evolve this kind of suicidal relationship to the natural world like where does where does that come from and i think that that of course is something that we can perhaps trace in the history of ideas and sometimes that history of ideas is actually embedded in the history of things right in objects that those objects uh, embody some of these ideas so that's kind of part of my interest in this and there's some aspect of it that's in the culture of collecting and the culture of, of display, starting with the earliest, you know, the pre-enlightenment collections and their kind of exuberance and their kind of, um, their, um, you know, their striving to understand the world. They're, they're basically trying to decipher the blueprint of God himself. So from that, there's a big jump to the Imperial Museum, which the Colonial Museum, which sees the world as a, uh, as a network of resources to be exploited, right? So, um, and and to what we think about as the museum today, which maybe is a much more um, kind of didactic institution. I've got loads of questions, but has anybody else got any? <laughs> Are there any questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th I think there's something, you know, like, you know, there's, the, the, of course, this famous Walter Benjamin quote, right, that there can be, you know, no object of, of uh, culture which isn't at the same time this emblem of uh, barbarity, right? So in the same way, we can, um, you know, we can marvel at an elephant skull and then also at the same time mourn that that is the skull that was, you know, taken from this incredible animal. And I think that that's part of that, the tension there, the, um, the unease about that is also part of what makes those objects powerful. Hi, I got a question for both for Mark and Victor. Um, I'm in, in in your installation, uh, Mark, it seems like that all the works that you've been choosing from the universe, I don't remember which universe in, in Germany you, you work for, are very neatly displayed, organized one next to the other. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and in your work, Victor, it seems like everything is very messy. Actually, you use this word, very messy. You know? And that's, it seems like it's essential for, you know, for your system of analyzing and interpreting things. So, question for both of you. Um, association between, between those works? What is the association? Is it a system of reading uh, through these works? Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I think that they're... Um, I think that, that, in a way, your museum is kind of quite organized. Mm. And the museum is, is supposed to be a, a One of the things that my museum is supposed to do is, is to create a sort of working model of the way my, my mind works. Um, and, well, certainly also when you, when you look at, uh, at natural systems, they're not organized on a, on a grid system. They are all manner uh, of different connections. So that there's a reason why I've, I've got a, a Furby where, I, where I've got a Furby. There's, there's sometimes the, I, I like, there's, there's lots of skulls, but the skulls are also next to I don't know, things in bottles, to seashells, to books. Um, to, to ceramics, to, to sculptures, to, to, to tribal art. Um, I find there's a narrative between it. Yeah, I think so too. And I, I think that like also museums have, you know, they are um, also maps of the mind, but maps of the mind of the societies that create them. They're, you know, they're kind of the official story of what gets to be called nature at a particular time or what gets to be a kind of national identity. But one of the things I liked, what Victor said, was talking about the um, uh, the moral policing of messiness, because there's also kind of moral policing of of collecting in general. There's lots of people who think that people shouldn't collect and shouldn't clutter their lives. And, you know, there's something as though, it's this kind of very Protestant thing in a sense, that, you, you know, you have this um, this idea that materiality is not to be trusted. And if you get this excess of materiality and clutter, that somehow uh, means a kind of moral slippage as opposed to a kind of neat minimalism in the same way that minimal and conceptual art are supposed to be more intelligent than expressionistic <laughs> art and, uh, and art that has a kind of ragged edges. And I just don't buy that as an argument. I just, um, uh, you know, I, I find that... Um, the, the roots of that come from very suspicious places to me. Well, they're very tendentious arguments, aren't they? So I will certainly strongly argue that, that mess is, is beautiful. Yeah. What about storage then? What happened? <laughs> Because mess is one thing, but the question of, a, of objects in storage, I find quite kind of like... Well, it's a disaster. My storage is a cardboard box. If I started labelling what was in the cardboard boxes, and then I, I gave up labelling what's in the cardboard boxes, and I haven't got a clue what's <laughs> a anywhere, really. And it, I have to open the boxes and dig through them, and then I'm not very good at packing, so I've found the one thing I want and everything else I haven't. So. Before, before, before that, um, oh no, so is, is it a direct line to that? Okay, first, that's a question for Roel, um, because you mentioned that the, can what, someone what, yeah, just turn that one off. Um, I wanted to, add, uh, because the museum where um, Mark had his retrospective in 2013 is also a collecting institution. So I wondered how the institution's engagement with Mark perhaps affect your collecting or display practices. Well, in a, in a way, um, the first piece we acquired at the museum, the, the costume bureau uh, with which I ended, in a, in a way I, I consider it as some sort of um, exemplary for the rest of the collection, or it's, it's, it's almost like, uh, for me it's a key work, uh, for instance, because it's, um, it, 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 it's describing um, it's it's paving a path for for the, the artist um, as some sort of um, 
uh, archaeologist of its own of his own time um, as a uh, cultural anthropologist, and I, I would say in 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 many different respects, um, the kind of art we are continuing to to collect. Um, it, it's definitely influenced by, by uh, Mark's work and Mark's vision and um, the exhibitions which we present very often focus on artists with a very strong socio-political activist, uh, gender, uh, culturally diverse or very often um, ecological um, or artists focusing on ecological issues, often very actively developing policies to change uh, local ecologies. Um, so Mark um, definitely changed the way of collecting and at the same time I would say um, he also very much um, fitted in, in some sort of program which we already were entering um, at that time and, and I think um, what, what I regret in a way or what I tried perhaps to <laughs> describe in, in, the, in, in, in the introduction I gave is that um, I, I, I would love the institution or I would love museums to be in a way more <laughs> radical uh, and I feel like if you present an artist like Mar Di Mark Dian, if you give him an exhibition. Um, I did manage to purchase two pieces or two, I would say, significant pieces for our collection. But in a way, I feel it's quite poor <laughs> still. <laughs> and it, um, it, if, if you work with an artist like Mark, um, I would love to fill, like the boys block, seven rooms with, with Mark's work and uh, kind of keep uh, collecting and um, it's it's a policy which a public museum is hardly able uh, to pursue but but I, I would um, I, I feel it would make way more sense uh, it would give indivi individual museums way more identity if these museums could really focus on few artists or a few uh, developments or go for a very radical specialization. Uh, one of the or the interview we did in the book ends with Mark saying, um, the, the thing I'm really disappointed with is going to another contemporary art museum and seeing a collection like almost like a stamp collection with one Andy Warhol, tr a trophy Andy Warhol and one um, uh, uh, Jackson Pollock. Uh, and in a way, it doesn't make sense to try to collect or duplicate the same kind of canon in every museum. It's really, really beautiful to kind of have a kind of develop a kind of couleur locale. And in a way, I, I would love to, uh, I would love the institution to kind of specialize way more and to focus on uh, an artist like Mark over years or over decades and try to kind of really <coughs> build such a kind of wunderkammer kind of display. I think that would make sense. Uh, I hope, I, I d I'm not sure if I answered your question, but. <laughs> um, so you've talked around this idea of, well actually you've just mentioned it with the museum's acquisition policy and this idea of it being part of what's inside your head and an identity. And I'm interested in how you know, whether you think that collecting is a personality thing and whether that's an innate kind of drive and how that therefore your collection is kind of a framework or a way of seeing you and you are, the, so the collector is at the center of this collection and they're a representation of you. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then, and yeah, exactly, a self-portrait. And then so how, you know, how do you then translate that in a museum context? Um, sorry, so that's kind of a few questions. Yeah. To Hong, in particular? Um, to any, uh, <laughs> you, you start, since you have the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, uh, um, perhaps answering your final question, I think the museum somehow bridges uh, or somehow mediates between 
artists or producers of objects and an audience or different audiences. And for me, it's kind of like, um, in a way, kind of very humble kind of intermediary between these different um, different people, different audiences, different uh, 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 backgrounds. Um, um, I don't know if um, if I'm answering your uh, if I'm answering your question. I guess, um, I guess it's more about translating an intense amount of research. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of this journey of research that it kind of forms a collection. And I just, I, I can see how that manifests in an artwork, but I, uh, I just wonder if it becomes therefore part, if a collection becomes a collection in a museum, it feels yeah. uh And of course the objects contextualize the other, con uh, the, uh, the other objects, I would, I would say. And that's of course very much the role of museums also to kind of bring together a group of, of artists who somehow um, contextualize each other or kind of give some sort of explain each other in a way. Um, um, again, I'm not sure if oh, I'm <laughs> perhaps yeah. <laughs> sorry. Well, I, I think we've always thought about collecting, collecting as, as a passion, right? And that's what's always made it interesting and that's what's made some of the most interesting collections and I think now we all feel a little bit insecure because there are obviously people who collect as investment, right? And, and that becomes something that people do and think about more and more. And people look to at least buying art as part of their investment portfolio without having knowledge, expertise, or love for it. So, and I, I think that that's, um, you know, that's kind of worrisome at the same time there's always been, there often has been this kind of element of the possibility of commerce and collecting. Even, um, you know, even Hamilton, you know, the great um, British collector was essentially an art dealer, you know, selling his um, vases and, and, uh, and, and works um, from, from, Ven uh, from Naples uh, throughout the whole process and, and the paintings that were produced uh, in his salon. So, you know, I think there's, there's been an element of that, but but I think this is a kind of tricky moment where art is being seen as a kind of investment and collecting is seen as an investment opportunity. But I think for most of us who are interested in cultures of collecting, we don't really look at that or think about that in a, as a very serious collecting. Well, yes, I mean, that's collecting is investment, isn't it? It's not collecting. It's, it's, it's the same thing. Collecting, I think it's, it's clearly it's a psychological condition that um, is only harmful when the person can't afford it and has to break the law to, well, not depending how they break the law, in order to enhance it, or where you know people call it hoarding and people are, they can't get into their house and they, and they, and they get get buried. But most for and uh, I think also the the term art collecting is it's so different from collecting in, in other spheres, that it, it's fairly irrelevant to a discussion of collecting, because most art collecting is, it's not collecting, it's know, whatever it else it is. Is it working? Yeah, okay. <laughs> First of all, thank you for the talks. Um, this is a question for Mark, um, and it's about working with natural history institutions. So you're one of the few artists that has actually made, had a permanent impact on natural history galleries, where a lot of artists are just temporary, temporarily in the museum space. But I just wonder what the limitations are for you of working with natural history collections and in natural history institutions versus working in contemporary art spaces and which one you find more productive. I'll tell you which one is more fun. <laughs> <laughs> you can put more toys 
Yeah, I mean, the Nat Natural History Museums are, are um, you know, I mean, they're, they're interesting places. In li you know, like all these institutions from the outside, they seem, you know, like these very unified ideological institutions. But the minute you go behind the scenes and the door clicks behind you, you realize that they're battlegrounds of ideas, right? And that people are, you know, it's the whole philosophy and display philosophy of the museum is one giant cat fight mm -hmm. behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And nobody, uh, you know, everyone's kind of fighting for how you deal with the history and, and display and where the resources are allocated and how you um, handle what is often a very problematic past, right? A lot of these museums have a lot to ask for, answer for in their relationship to um, to race and class and, and colonialism and how straightforward they want to be about that really makes a difference between uh, between the museums. So whereas it might be very possible to do something here in London uh, and uh, in Berlin it would be very difficult to do something in New York and Washington. Um, so uh, you know a lot um, depends on uh, you know I think a lot of institutions invite artists in to kind of help them deal with that difficult transitional period, right? With them just being able to um, speak the truth about their past and 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 uh, give better access. Um, you know, for me, I'm, I'm always interested in kind of searching for these uh, odd objects that, uh, these often orphaned objects that are in the collection that no longer fit the mandate of the museum um, because maybe they're technologies that are obsolete or they um, they represent things that the museum was once interested in but they're not interested in anymore or they are considered archaic representations so they they can never be integrated back into the museum's mission but they can't be thrown out either because they're wonderfully produced interesting things so can we find another way of making those things speak? And sometimes we can make them speak about that, about the museum's history in that way. Um, so, you know, I think there's a kind of permissiveness in working in the, um, in the art museum. Um, but there's also a kind of limitation about the audience. I know a lot about who's going to walk through those doors. Whereas the Natural History Museum can have a very different kind of audience in a sense. Um, and you know, it's, it's also very interesting to to see which people in that field are able to talk about art. A lot of scientists are extremely knowledgeable about about culture. You know, contemporary art, music, dance, performance, literature. Uh, I, th I think people don't imagine that that's true. I would say that artists are way more ignorant about science than scientists are about art. So um, you know, I always find that that at least. Uh, um, you know, a good half of the staff are willing to meet me halfway.